Good evening to those who are, are coming on just now. I see Celia is on. Good to see you. Good to have you on this evening. And, uh, and uh, I know that there are a couple other persons that's on. Christine Smith Campbell. Yes, and if Celia is on, then it means that Laverne is not too far behind. And so I want to greet Brother Watson as well. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the pictures are similar, right? And sometimes if you're not careful, you're not sure who it is until you see the name. But it's good to have the Watsons at Bible studies this evening. And it's, it's good to have uh, others who are coming on. God has been good. This is another day that we, we are seeing the, the end of it drawing closer and closer in terms of the 24-hour day, that is. And, uh, you know, we just, we, just, we just have to be grateful, have to express gratitude every time for the blessings of the Lord, the blessing of life, which is, which is always so, so important, always so critical. You know, there are a number of things going on around us at any given point in time. Some we have control of, others we just can't control. So the elements are many, and sometimes we, we just really can't control all of them. And we shouldn't try. We should just allow God to take care of us and, and, and lead us accordingly, the, you know, from the prayer of serenity. You know, to grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change. You know, the, the courage to change the things that we can. That is the things that we have control of. And most importantly, the wisdom to distinguish between the two. The wisdom to know the difference between those things that we can change and the things that we cannot. Let's work on the things that we can change by God's grace. And let's just turn over the things that we're struggling with, the things that we, we, we fail at every day. Just turn them over to him and let him take care of them for us. Uh, we have life and, and, and with that we can be hopeful, we can remain hopeful that things that we didn't accomplish today, we will get a chance to, to, to get another go at them tomorrow or sometime in the future, God's willing. But let's not sacrifice the opportunity to recognize and to acknowledge and give praise to God. You know, let's not uh, 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 make that uh, disappear or elude us, you know, at the expense at, or as the expense, you know, for those things that we really can't do anything about. Right. So let's recognize in this moment, you know, the goodness of God. And, and just to recognize in a personal way that God has blessed me. And, and I want you to just make that personal, you know, just to recognize, yes, that God has blessed me. Without comparing yourself to anybody else, right? Without looking at what is happening in anybody else's life. Just to recognize, right, the fact that you can see me, you can hear me. The fact that you have your mental faculties working and you are alert enough to figure out what I'm saying and to, or to understand what I'm saying, then you, you are able to say, you know, God has indeed blessed me. I am a blessed man. And, and you can say the same, you're a blessed man, you're a blessed woman, and just know that it is indeed so because you are alive. That is indeed such a blessing. So join me, everyone, wherever you are. And let us offer gratitude to God as we go to him in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you for life. Lord, there's nothing that we can do without that. And so that is a numero uno on the list. Oh God, uh, as we pray, as we offer thanks and, and to give gratitude to you, we thank you for life. Lord, for breathing new life into us every day by waking us up. Lord God, for taking us through the day, your sustaining hands have been upon us. Lord, you have kept us. 
Lord, you have protected us. You, you have provided for us, Lord. You, you make provisions, and you are perfect in all your ways. So thank you, God, for every blessing. Indeed, all of us can identify as blessed individuals to varying degrees. But God Almighty, oh Lord, all of us blessed by you. So God, we take the time to acknowledge you, Lord, and, and to just give you praise and to give you thanksgiving. Offer it to you, Lord, and you alone for bringing us thus far. Hitherto, you have brought us. Lord, many of us, we have toiled hard, we, we have struggled, we have, oh God, experienced heartaches and pain and sorrow and loss. Lord God, all of us mourn from time to time. Lord, sometimes upon reflection, Lord God, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are thrusted into a time of mourning, Lord, oh God, but we are thankful to you, Lord, that your peace which passes all understanding, Lord, it belongs to us. And Lord, you offer that to us every day. We thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that you give that can help us to decipher, help us to come to terms with the way things are. Lord God Almighty, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercies that go before us. God, we can spend the time just giving you glory and honor. Because you are indeed worthy. Lord, you're worth it. God Almighty, and you deserve it. So, Lord, we, we, we pause, Lord, and we can reflect. But definitely, Lord, we know that we owe you a debt of gratitude that we cannot repay. So, Lord, accept our worship. Accept our praise. Forgive us for getting lost sometimes. Forgive us, Lord, for going astray. Forgive us, Lord, for being petty at times forgive us lord for our hypocrisies lord and our pretentious selves lord you know who we are lord you know who we are we cannot hide from you so lord we bear our souls before you and ask you lord to show us mercy lead us as we embark on another session of studies lord may our hearts god be be prepared and lord may we be moved by your word and may we Oh Lord, at, the, at the, the move of the Holy Spirit, Lord, grasp your word. And, oh Lord, to be able to put it into practice. So may your blessings be upon us, Lord. And may you add your blessings to the reading of your word as we embrace it in our lives. And, oh Lord, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I want to thank you so very much for joining me another Wednesday evening. Uh, I know that the curfew has been, uh, the, the curfew times would have gone to 11 p.m. And but we are not yet ready to to go back into into the sanctuary for Bible studies. Uh, night services are not very possible because of the work that is going on down there. And so the electrical wiring is, is all over the place. But all in due season, you know, when we'll be able to get back and convene Bible studies from the sanctuary and, of course, be able to still uh, uh, broadcast it via this platform to those who are not able to come. And so that people can have it, that they can, you know, go back to it uh, as, as long as it's available. And, and just refresh themselves in case they may have missed anything. But that's just my way of saying to our, our virtual viewers, our viewership, that we will not forget you. No. But we thank God that, you know, we are, we are having, a, we received a, a, a reprieve. Let me not call it a little reprieve. Uh, let me not sound ungrateful. But God has, has, has given us you know, the, the wherewithal to function in, in a broader capacity and so we can entertain more persons, especially on a Sunday, and we're truly grateful for that. My prayer and our prayer should be that things will get better, not just for Jamaica, but for the world. And so we continue to pray for our brothers and our sisters and people all over the world who are still grappling with this pandemic, with this virus. Sometimes I get the feeling that you know, they're, 
there are some persons who may be benefiting from this one way or the other who may not really be keen on seeing us out or seeing us get out of the woods it's sad that 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 would even come into my spirit but but it's just based on what is happening what you see in the media what you you read what you're hearing right you know you get the feeling that our world and and the powers that be and the rulers that be are afraid to even talk about good news right it's it's just too much doom and gloom and you know every day it's something else and there's a new variant and you know the, the the vaccines might resist or rather the new variants might resist the vaccines and you know i kind of think you, you know you get the feeling that boy maybe they just want people to just go lock themselves away somewhere or head to the hills right and and just just go back to living in huts and in caves and so on and we just stay away from the general public and from each other but i i i want to remain hopeful and i want to keep faith alive and i want to encourage you uh, to do the same uh, irrespective of what the scientists will say what the doctors will say I, I know someone who knows more than they do right on any given day I know someone who controls nature and has the power to speak to, to, to anything and everything that is that is that is taking place and that would have would have befallen us so I want us to to stay hopeful I want you to keep faith alive and I want you to just trust God in everything that you do. Just to go out in the mornings and to come in in the evenings or nights, whatever your schedule might be like. Just to trust God to keep you as you go. Right? We have an obligation to still follow the measures that are in place. But let us not, be, let us not allow doubt to overwhelm us. But let us trust God and you know, just, just keep faith alive that God will take us out of this and will take us beyond all that uh, prevails right now. So uh, let me also uh, wish a happy uh, birthday. Uh, certainly today, Sister, Sister Lacey and Bright Rose is celebrating her birthday today. And I want to send out a special birthday blessing for her and um, for all those who would have celebrated birthdays belated birthday greetings and maybe you might have a birthday coming up or a wedding anniversary well please accept greetings and blessings on whatever it is that you will be celebrating it is the month of July right and we just want to recognize all the July celebrants whatever it is that you are celebrating in this time in this month well the blessings of the lord belongs to you take it it's free praise the lord all right uh our, our study this evening is going to take us to um the the uh, sorry luke chapter 15 saint luke chapter 15 and um i'm not going to read all of this because it is a passage that is is quite familiar but luke chapter 15 saint luke chapter 15 verse 11 to 32 yes that's a that's a lengthy reading but uh you you know the parable it's the parable of the prodigal son and anybody on this platform who has never heard this parable before um you 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 may have neglected to read the new testament right but look at it it, it is there i want you to follow as we go through right the the prodigal son saint luke chapter 15 verse 11 to 32 um this concludes a series of parables all connected you know speaking to the same thing you know a, a father's love for his children right and uh we've looked at to, to the to that end uh the the lost sheep the lost coin and this evening we're going to turn our attention to the prodigal son now, uh, Jesus, the, 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 just, just to, for us to, to bear the context in mind, starting from uh, verse 1 of St. Luke chapter 15 and following, uh, we see uh, Jesus responding to a charge that was being laid against him by the Pharisees and the scribes, right? that, that he is actually uh, 
uh, entertaining sinners and, and tax collectors. And, uh, you know, especially the tax collectors, they were most abhorrent to the Pharisees and the, the religious leaders, right? Because they saw them as exploiters of their own people because they were collecting, not just collecting taxes, uh, but overcharging with taxes from their own brethren to appease the Romans. They were doing it in the behalf of the Roman government. And so they didn't really embrace the tax collectors. Even though the tax collectors were Jews, they did not embrace them. And so to see Jesus embracing them and, and having a meal with them, you know, having a drink with them, going into their homes, right? Uh, they didn't like that. And, and, and so Jesus responded uh, to, to, to their accusation that he received sinners and eats with them. You know, he responded with these three parables, right? We've looked at the lost sheep and the lost coin, right? Now we turn to the prodigal son. And, and, and this is possibly the most popular, part, one of the most, if not the most popular parable in the New Testament, right? The prodigal son. And uh, prodigal here means wasteful. Right, so it's the wasteful son. I don't know how many of you uh, would have looked into that before, right? But prodigal does not mean uh, that you, you know, doesn't necessarily just speak of someone who goes away from the Lord, but it's all it also speaks about someone who, up more appropriately, is wasteful, you know, like a big spender just spend without, without uh, doing any checks and balances right and so we'll just waste money waste resources uh, that's that's the the appropriate uh, term or meaning rather for prodigal right so of course you can the prodigal son would mean you know the son that was very wasteful right the wasteful son uh it it it, it can rightly be called though according to one warren wearsby uh it can rightly be called uh the the loving father right because the parable itself reveals more about the love of the father than of the sinfulness of the son right so so it, the focus is not only to, to be placed on the prodigal son or some people say the prodigal boy right but it must also be placed and quite rightly so on the loving father because that's the kind of message that that Jesus wanted to send and is sending today to his, his disciples, those who follow him, right? That, that, that uh, the Father has a love and a concern and is very caring towards those who may become wayward or those who are lost in sin, those who are sinners, those who are not saved that he wants to and he will embrace them if they are remorseful if they repent and come back to him right and we must never ever try to send any message to the world that 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 you may be irredeemable right uh, let god be the judge of that let him determine that but we must never ever suggest even slightly to anyone that you know, salvation may be beyond you, right? God is merciful. God is loving. God is kind. He relents with judgment so that more people can be saved, right? That's the kind of God that he is. He's willing to embrace anyone who will repent. So the, the parable itself also reveals much about the heart of, of the unforgiving elder son, the big brother, right? Not many persons look at the big brother appropriately either, right? Uh, uh, his purpose in this parable uh, is to rebuke those who are unwilling to reach out and, and receive the lost to repent. And we're going to look at this, this big brother, the elder son's attitude as we, we go along a little bit later. So let's, let's look at the parable. And, and see what we can we can gain from it 
right? The parable of parables, someone would, 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 would put it, because of how popular it is. Now, this, uh, uh, a, a younger son asked his father, right? And you can look at it with me from St. Luke chapter 15 from verse 11, right? A, a younger son asked his father, and I'm summarizing it for you here, right? To give him his portion of the inheritance due him, right? Now, while this was not a common practice, right, that you usually inheritance is after you die, that the, after you die, that your loved ones would get inheritance or you get inheritance after your uh, uh, parents or guardians or, or whomever it is that, that, that uh, bequeaths or, or leaves whatever inheritance for you after they die. But um, Jesus coins the parable this way, that the younger son ask the father to give him his portion right i don't want to wait until you die right i want you to give it to me no and according to the law of moses though the eldest son received a double portion right and and this can be referenced in deuteronomy 21 verse 17 and this is the law of moses right but he shall acknowledge the son of the uh, unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has for he is the beginning of his strength the right of the firstborn is his right so a, a high priority was placed on the firstborn right no 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 this is the the child Right, that that and and, and 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 note son, right? This was according to the culture of the time, and this was by Mosaic law that the firstborn son would receive a double portion, right? Now, if there's another son or other sons, then they will have to split up uh, the one third that is left. In this parable, there are two sons. The elder son would get a uh, a, a double portion that means that uh, the younger son would receive one third right of the inheritance the total inheritance because a double portion belonged to the the bigger brother right so like so many imp impatient young people right today uh, the younger son desired to be free from parental restraints I you know I don't want I, that I don't want you to, to, to be in control of my life anymore. I want mine, right? And, and poor Britney Spears <laughs> uh, today uh, must wish that she had the opportunity like this son because uh, Britney Spears uh, is not in control of her own life, sadly. And, and, and she has to be in court now with, 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 with her, her father and family right that has her wealth and her fortune under what they call conservatorism right where they monitor her if she wants to do anything if she wants to buy something she has to get permission from them they have to give the all clear before she can spend one cent they tell her whether or not she can have she's allowed to have a child you know whether or not she can start a business right and 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 she must be thinking boy if if i were living in the time of the prodigal son then i could easily well just say give me my inheritance right so this young man was able to do that and she he he demanded that boy the father right give him what is rightfully his by inheritance it wasn't rightfully his yet as a matter of fact there was no law that was in place that could allow or could make the father accede to his request but nevertheless the father uh, uh grants him his request because he wanted the inheritance no didn't want to wait until after the death of his father the father grants him the request and and you know he gets his inheritance and he goes off into a the bible says uh, jesus says a distant country right now his life abroad after leaving his father's house with his inheritance you know can also be summarized according to saint luke 15 and verse 13 to 19 
Now, the, the, the prodigal that is wasteful, being wasteful and extravagant, right, with, with this kind of a lifestyle, he soon depletes his possession, right? All that the father would have given him, he, he no longer has it. Everything is gone, right? Easy come, easy go. You see, anything you didn't work for, you, you, have, you have no thought about how valuable it might be or it, it, it is because it's easy come. This is why scammers really can't come out to anything successful. And those who will scheme and those who will con others out of their, their hard-earned uh, 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 money and resources, they just don't know how to spend it because it's easy come, easy go. This young man didn't work for this, right? He couldn't even wait until the time that it would have been due, which is after his father's death. He wanted his inheritance now. So in other words, that give me what I haven't worked for, you work for it, I don't have to work for it, but give it to me. Soon after, and this is where the prodigal uh, uh, label is really added, right? Because he became wasteful, and extravagant he soon depletes all his possessions his poverty is complicated by a famine striking the country right and that's what you call double jeopardy right i mean he, he, he couldn't help himself no he had no friends all his friends because usually when you get money that way right you're going to attract a number of people right and once you have that money flowing you will have those people around. You see, once the money is not there anymore, that's it. Those friends were attached to the money, right? Or the friendship was attached to the money that you had. So once the money is no longer there, once the resources are no longer there, the friendships will no longer be there. Sad, but that is what happens with easy money, right? Didn't work for it. You don't know how to value it. You don't know how to invest it. You don't know how to use it. So you become a spendthrift and you just floss and endorse and just, you know, just, just, just party all night long and just, just have fun, right? And just do what you want to do because, hey, it's my life. I can do whatever I want with it. So he, he, he experienced extreme poverty. He had nothing left. He had no money, no resources, no friends right nothing to eat he couldn't support himself anymore he didn't think about going back home you know, no doubt he would be embarrassed he would feel like a failure well he was a failure right so all of that feeling on the inside right pride will be high you know just to think about going back home you know would sort of make him feel like no 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 i can't do that right i took money that i i didn't work for I took an inheritance that I wasn't even supposed to get just yet. And now I have nothing to show. So, to top that off, to make things work worse, there is a famine. Right? And so he found himself, right, hired to another. Now remember, no, no, this boy is coming from a home where, you know, his father was the master. Right? They had servants. So he, would, he, could, lit, he, he could literally be seen as a prince right they had servants that 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 would would run to their beck and call anything that they needed anything that he wanted he could get it right now he no longer had servants working for him and to satisfy and please him he was now working for somebody else he was hired he took a job and he took one of the worst jobs that 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 writers and scholars will tell you could have been considered one of the worst ever jobs that a Jew could take, caring for swines. He became a pig farmer, right? Not like he owned a pig farm, but he was hired by someone to take care of pigs. That's what you call from the palace to the pigsty, right? And he, he took, the, he took, he took the, a hard nose dive from that palace into that pigsty. That's where he found himself. Now, with great number, with great hunger, right you know the bible says that boy he thought about it and, and and no doubt actually had to do it to gladly eat what was given to the pigs right that's how hungry the bible suggests that he was 
that he would often long to eat the very food that was given to the pig. From the palace to the pigsty eating pig food. Right? This was not a good look for a Jew. As a matter of fact, there was a saying that was, that was quite popular among Jews at the time. Right? May a curse come upon the man who cares for swine. Right? May a curse come upon the man who cares for swine. Right? And, and, and that wasn't really a, a, a direct reference to a Jew because they didn't think that any Jew could end up doing that. Right? So when a Jew found himself in that position, you know that that curse would definitely be seen to be on that Jew. Now, with, 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 he finally comes to his senses, though, right? You know, he had it, he was up there, took a nosedive, lost everything, including friendships, right? Found himself uh, uh, working in the worst place that he could ever, ever uh, 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 think about working. And, uh, well, he didn't even think about working because he would never have to work. No, he had to be working and adding to that in the worst place imaginable by a Jew or for a Jew. But the Bible puts it beautifully. Jesus says in the parable that he came to his senses. Right? He came to his senses. Recalling how well fed his father's hired servants were. Though they worked for his father, they were well fed and they didn't have to eat pig food or they didn't have to eat with the animals. They had everything that they could want and they were servants. They had plenty and here, this young man was perishing with hunger. So, he was hungry, he was humiliated, and now he became homesick. Because it takes a toll on you, you know, when, when you're going through some struggles that you may have brought on yourself based on the bad choices that you make in life. Uh, listen, the devil is not seeking friendships, you know, right? He just wants to destroy you. So after you would have pleased him and gone out on the limb, gone off the tangent and go out to enjoy yourself and live life the way you want to and you have taken a nosedive, don't think that the devil is coming to encourage you. He's going to rub it in. He's going to bring back to your memory oh, how you had it. Because depression must sink in and the next thing you know, you're putting a rope around your neck, Right? ready to commit suicide because that is what depression can do especially when it gets intense right and you start to reflect and tears are coming down your eyes you are you don't know what to do you you are hungry you are humiliated right you feel as though you have let down everybody right you've let down god you've let down uh, your family right the devil has you exactly where he wants you at the point where the only thing left for you to do is snap and just take your own life because life would have become so depressing that's the only logical thing left for you to do. This young man came to his senses. Thank God. And there comes a point where we need to come to our senses. Yes? And so he resolves to return home. Yeah, it's going to be embarrassing. And boy, I'm, I'm going to be seen as a letdown. But I, I think that whatever it is that I'm going to get when I go back to my father's home, it has to be better than what I'm in now. Right? And that's what coming to his senses mean, you know, right? You, you sit down and you think about something logically and you say, hey, I don't need to be here. Even if I go back home to my parents, right, I am certain that boy, I would be in a much comfortable bed. I would be in a bed. I am certain that I would not have to be eating or longing to eat pig's food. I would get something because even the hired servants, those who work for my father, they are eating much better than this, right? And he would know this because he would have seen it firsthand, right? Because he would have been a prince in his father's home. So he says to himself, I am going to go home. I'm going to say, Father, 
I have sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven, right? That is the will of God. I walked away from it, right? I am going to confess my unworthiness to my, my father and, 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 and uh, to be made, ask him not, not to forgive me, but to make me as one of his hired servants. Because he knew that as a hired servant, he would be living much better than he was working in a pigsty, longing to eat pig food. You know, there, there are some things that you do or you find yourself in some, some situations where you can just logically think and come to your senses and just say, wow, it, it can't get any worse than this. You know, when you hit rock bottom, right? You know, you hit rock back bottom, you know, when you look up and you are seeing the bottom of the bucket, you know that you have hit rock bottom. You know you can't go any lower than that, right? I, I remember hearing a story about a young lady who applied for a job with, with a, a, another company. She had a job and she decided that she wanted to apply somewhere else. So when they called her in for the interview, they asked her to give uh, one, one of the reasons why she chose to apply to that company. She said to them in the interview, because the salary will be better. So they said to her, how do you know that the salary will be better here? We haven't had any discussions concerning salary. She said she knows that anywhere that she goes to, the salary will be better than where she is currently. Right? So without even knowing what the salary will be like, she knows it just can't be any worse than where she is. So this young man, it's, it's something similar. He, he thought to himself, logically, hey, it, it can't get any worse than this. I'm working in a pigsty, here longing to eat the pig's food. Right? When my father's servants, hired servants at home, they're eating, you know, all kinds of delicacies and certainly not like this. So I'm going home. I am going back home. And so this young man took the trek home. Right? He was going home and no doubt thinking to himself what he was going to do. You know, I mean, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess my sins I'm, I'm going to confess my unworthiness to be called his son my father's son i'm going to ask him to make me a hired servant while he was on the way the bible says while he was still a great way away the father sees him coming and and, and this is this is the response i want us to look at at the different responses from the different characters that jesus highlights in this parable right no no the father the father's response is, is is quite quite interesting right the father's great love is immediately evident he sees his son coming you know naturally this man would have no doubt or possibly would get up every day every morning and he would be looking anticipating that you know what my boy might come home right because even though you know i mean it starting to read the prodigal son it doesn't speak about it as as vividly and as clearly in terms of words right but no doubt this man loved his son and wanted him to come home i mean he he he, he caved in and uh, to his request and gave him his inheritance but that does not mean he didn't love his son he saw him coming from afar off right and the bible says that the father has compassion right he didn't see him coming and say where is our work this one and they go <laughs> what 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 you would he work with self hello don't worry come up here so turn back go, uh, uh, wherever you come from go back there don't come back in my house. Don't come back on my property. No, the father had compassion. Know what he did in, in, in the text. He, he runs to greet his son. He didn't run the son away or chase him away. But he runs to meet the son. He throws his arms around his son's neck. He drape him up and say, boy, how are you away there? <laughs> And give him two bucks, two slap cross in face. No, he hugs his son. He throws his arms around his son's neck. And typical to their custom, but then, as it still is today, he kisses his son. Right? He 
kisses his son and you know because he's so excited that his son is back the son in response to his father's response quickly confesses his sin and his unworthiness to be called a son but before he could say as he planned it out in his head make me and hire a hired servant before he could say that right the father joyfully calls his servants to what one to bring out the best robe and to put it on him my god man this man was probably in his mind he's thinking boy i'm coming back expecting to be a servant make me one of your hired servants that's what i was gonna say but by the time he could come out with that the father is calling the servants come 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 hey, come 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 bring out the best robe put it on him put a ring on his finger right and sandal, sandals on his feet right because that suggests that his royalty right never left it was still there that's what the robe and the ring symbolizes that this man my son he still must be given the royal treatment because he's my son. The father says further, right? He says, I want you to kill the fatted calf in order to celebrate his return. You know that the fatted calf, you know, you know that you save for a special occasion. You know, you don't just get up and kill the fatted calf, meaning you know the best animal that you have there you know the prize bull or you know the prize animal that's for a special occasion and not just any special occasion the fatted calf <coughs> sorry was not just for a birthday right no the fatted calf was for extra special you know there is a section in hanover where people when they want to add emphasis to special they say special as S P R E C I A L, you know, it is special, right? That's that's what you save the fatted calf for. Yet the father, at the return of his son, who would have been wasteful, would have been a, a big spender, right? And and nose dived into poverty, now came home, and the father says, Bring out the fatted calf. Wow, that means grand celebration brothers and sisters i want you to understand that all of this served to reinstate the son as a person of importance and authority the father was saying none of you get this twisted right he went away right and 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 this was not by what was not in his best interest we were not in support of it but he wanted it we gave it to him he went away right clearly he's come back impoverished but hey don't get it twisted he's not coming back as 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 a prodigal he's not coming back as someone that we're gonna throw in the dungeon or throw him uh, down in 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 the in, under the bus or we're going to we're gonna put him to hard work now so he can he can pay us back and learn his lesson teach him a lesson no the father wanted them to recognize that his son was important and that his son had or regained authority put on his robe put on his ring we never throw them away and bring out the fatted calf now the father and the servants they respond positively right what this means to the father is is touchingly summarized in the words in 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 in, in the text for this my son was dead and is alive again right he was lost and is found and and i want to believe that that any loving parent right now can attest to this you can relate to these emotions expressed by the father no matter how wayward your boy is oh my god he, when he comes home right and and even if you get the feeling that he might be in trouble you want to protect him you want to care for him you want to give him the best that you can because he's your son your daughter it is the same thing it's your children no matter what trouble they're in because you birthed them you brought them into this world and you want what is best for them Nobody can tell me no foolishness. If you have a child that workless and you come and treat them a certain way when they come back to you, that, that, that tells us exactly where them get the workless attitude from. Yes? 
The apple don't fall far from the tree. Parents must love their children unconditionally. To the extent where you want nothing but to help them, you want to see them survive, you want all that is best. Not, I'm not encouraging covering up for wrongdoings, no. But I'm saying that boy, you want what is best for your children. They were away, now they're back. You know, you don't have time to quarrel and cuss, right, and fuss with them. I don't even want to talk about or to reminisce on what the argument was about. I am just glad that you are home. You are safe. I am going to help you. I am going to take care of you. Any parent can relate to this. But I want you to notice the response of the brother. The elder brother. Yes? The elder son. Now he was returning from the field and he's wondering, oh, what's the celebration for? What's going on? It's not an anniversary. It's not my birthday. And if it's my birthday and they wanted to surprise me with a party, why have they started the party before I arrive? Right? You know, he may have been wondering to himself, well, what's going on? No, nobody told me about this party. Is it that I'm not invited? Because when I went out this morning, everything seemed normal. Now I'm coming back home and there is celebration, music is playing, people are dancing. And then he looks and he sees the fatted calf. And he was like, no man, this, this is big. Why would Papa bring out the fatted calf unless it's something grand? Wow, maybe daddy is going to make me in charge fully. He's going to retire and he's, he's having this party to hand over to me. So bring on the fatted calf. Then he goes in and he realizes, or rather, he's told by one of the servants, right, that your brother is back. He's like, which brother? That? After me, I have no brother, right? Because they all thought that that brother would have died. The servant said to him, hey, your brother is back. Your younger brother that we thought was dead is back. Now, he was angry. And I know that some of you might, might even be willing to, to side with him and say, yes, he has a right to be angry. Of course he had, he, you know, within, there must be something there logically that would say, hey, this brother, this younger brother, he messed up. Right? He messed up and he comes back and everybody's behaving as if, boy, this is some grand jubilee. Right? What is happening? Right? He messed up. He took his inheritance, which, which, which he had no right to ask for, but the father gave it to him because he insisted. He didn't take it and go start a business and, you know, you know set up his own vineyard or, or his own little farm. Or, no, he went out and he was spending, flossing and endorsing and, 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 and partying and just having fun and, and, and sleeping with a different harlot every night and, you know, just doing the things the way he wanted to, loose, without any regard for his background. Or for his future. Now he comes back because everything falls flat for him. And you guys are having a party. This brother was angry. Right? He was angry. And from all human perspective. You know you want to say he had every right to be angry. But let's assess it a little more. Because you know that when we look at the scriptures. When we look at attitudes that, that, that befit the Christian walk. We can't just look at human responses. We have to look and think bigger than that. We have to look and think walking in the spirit, right? So I know that we are quick to identify and say, you know, pastor, but, but what do you expect? And I can identify because I'm human. But I'm telling you, right, as I speak to all of us tonight, that we have to learn to be bigger than that. We must never ever just accept as an excuse, I am only human. God calls us to greater standards, higher standards, higher planes, right? The bar has been set by Jesus Christ. We have been given the fruit of the Spirit to cultivate. And Paul would, would have encouraged us, right, as he writes to, to the church, the churches in Ephesus, right, as he writes to the Corinthians, Paul would have encouraged us and by extension us today to walk in the spirit. 
walk in the spirit. It's a spiritual walk as much as it is a physical one. So while we can agree from a human perspective, purely human perspective, right, we can identify with this brother's anger, right? But, but we must also look at the father's response to the older brother. The father, recognizing that the son is angry, he goes out to, to him and he pleads with him. Come on, man. Yes? For many years, you know, the elder brother says, I have served you. Right? I, I, I never transgressed. I, I never walked away. I stayed with you. I could have gone. But I stayed with you. The father had never provided such a celebration for him. The father has never honored his loyalty. And the fact that boy, he has never ever left the father. Not one time. But when the son who squandered his father's inheritance with harlots returns home, the fatted calf is killed for him. I think that... He, I, <laughs> I don't think that the brother mind the rope. I don't think that the brother mind the ring. I don't even think the brother mind the party as much as the fatted calf. Come on, man. From a human perspective, the brother was like, man, this is one big joke you're taking too far. Right? The brother's like, my God, man. No, 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 daddy, man. Mm -mm, mm -mm. This joke gone too far. Now listen, man, this is like adding insult to injury. Right? Fine, you throw him a party, he's back. But the fatted calf? You never, you never gave me a fatted calf. And I never went anywhere. I never disrespected you. I, I was loyal. You know, we feel that loyalty must always be rewarded. You know, boy, you think about that. You're working in a company and, boy, you remain loyal to, to your directors and to your bosses. And you do whatever they say. You go above and beyond the call of duty, right? You work overtime. You work on weekends. You put your job ahead of your family sometimes. And guess what? When the time came for a promotion, they gave it to somebody that, that, that never took the time a day to, to, put, to go the extra mile. Didn't even work full time every day. Left early, always sick. For some other reason, you know, they gave the promotion. And you are there wondering, come on, I have been loyal, right? I worked hard, much harder than anybody else. You never had take out a, a fatted calf for me, but you took out the fatted calf for this son who disrespected you, who trampled on our traditions and our customs and our family legacy and went and embarrassed you. And now he's back. And you bring out the fatted calf. No, sir. While I can, and, and this is me now, just, just putting myself in the sun, true, the elder son. While I can understand the party, the robe and the ring, but the fatted calf, no man. Mm -mm. That one gone too far. The father responds to the son. Because the son, the elder son, referred to his brother as, as this child. Yes, that, that, that's how it is appropriately coined in the Greek. Didn't want to refer to him as his brother in any formal way. But the father would remind him. Yes? The father would, would recognize the, the, the elder son's faithfulness. And he says to him, you are always with me. Right? But your brother, my son, who went away, is now back with us. Right? So the father wanted to appease his feeling. I wanted to, to, to help him to understand some things. Right? I know you're angry. I understand your anger. But I want you to come up a little bit higher and look at it from a proper perspective. The father reassures his son that, listen, everything that I have is yours. Remember then that this is a son that is guaranteed a double portion. Right? And with the younger son, taking his one-third and go and waste it. He has nothing more to get by law. So the father is reminding the older son that everything that is here right now belongs to you. So why do you worry yourself about fatted calf for? Right? In other words, would you prefer fatted calf as opposed to the inheritance? I don't think that he would just want a fatted calf at all. So the father said to him, Everything, all that I have is yours. Yet the father maintains that it is right to celebrate. Celebrate your brother. Not just a child. Not just 
a little boy, but celebrate your brother. He says, this is your brother, right? The elder son says, this son of yours. In the Greek, it, it, as I mentioned or hinted at earlier, it is, it, is, it is more what the elder son was, was, was saying, literally, is this little immature child, right? When he said, this son of yours, that's with sarcasm, right? In other words, this little immature, you know, son of yours that, that is just, just, just full of excitement and, and want to have fun. And, you know, he's childish. And when you look at what he did, that was indeed childish. But the father wants him to put it into perspective. He says, he's not just this, this son of mine, but this is your brother, right? The father emphasizes the brotherly relation. This is your brother. This is your blood. It's two on all we have. It's, we, I, there's nothing in there that suggests that there were any other children, right? The inheritance would have been for the two of them. The elder brother got a double portion, and the younger one would get a third, Right? So he said, this is your brother. At the end of the day, brothers and sisters, I need you as much as you need me. We need each other because we are all we have. You are all I have. I am all you have. The father says, this is your brother. He was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he is found. The father was repeating exactly what the servants would have said to him, the elder son. Your brother who was dead is now alive. He was lost, but now he's found. In other words, he's back home. Let us cherish that. Let us celebrate the fact that he's not dead. We can love him some more. We can help him. Don't worry about the inheritance. It's yours. Nobody can take it away from you. Right? Don't worry about the fatted calf. We're going to have more fatted calves anyways. This is not the only one that can get fat, so we're going to have plenty more. That's not important. The important thing is not the celebration. It's not the party that we're having for him. It is not the robe. It is not the ring that was placed on his finger. It's the fact that he is with us. He has come home. He was lost, but now he's found. Brothers and sisters, we don't know how the story ends in terms of how it played out after that. We don't know if the older brother embraced him, his younger brother. We don't know what the, the family tension may have been like if, if there were any tension, if there was any tension at all, right? But from the context of it, the message that Jesus wanted to get across would suggest that the brother would no doubt look at it from his perspective, right? But I want us to learn to apply this passage to our lives i want you to understand that we can assign we can assign a, a meaning to all the characters the main characters that are mentioned right the, the father in this parable no doubt would symbolize our heavenly father god the creator elohim yes yahweh adonai yes the father here no doubt symbolizes our heavenly father the prodigal son in coming home represents the penitent sinner. Oh, I've wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. You know, you know that, that, that's what the, the, the prodigal son represents here. The penitent sinner who, who strayed, who, who went away, right, lived loosely, right, you know, just, just wasted everything, you know, did not spend his resources or expend his resources on, 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 on matters of importance, but just had a good time. But now he has returned. And that is, that represents the penitent sinner. The elder brother reflected the attitude of the self-righteous Pharisees and scribes. Yes? That, that's what they represented. Because they were now questioning Jesus. How can you be sitting with sinners and tax collectors? Huh? 
If, if you were indeed the Messiah, you would know that these men, that, that they are exploiters of their own people and they tax us beyond measure unfairly and that we shouldn't have anything to do with them. If you were the Messiah, you would have known this and would not have entertained them. Hence the parable of the lost sheep that the master wants to find that one and would leave the 99 and go and find that one and would celebrate upon finding that one. The parable of the lost coin that that woman would search out that entire house that is dusty and filled with dirt and in, 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 with the light of a candle or a lamp just to find that coin. And now this, 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 this prodigal son wayward and wasteful as he was returned and was penitent but here the elder brother could not embrace him initially according to the parable because he felt he didn't deserve it he felt that he should be punished no doubt he felt that boy he should be condemned he should be chased away he shouldn't be welcomed in because he had it all and he just blew it he messed up so this elder son elder brother reflects the attitude of you could even take out the pharisees and scribes and just say reflects the attitude of the self-righteous because we still have a lot of them today the ones who feel that you know some people just shouldn't be in the church some people shouldn't be baptized some people shouldn't receive the right hand of fellowship because they're not worthy you know they don't fit the profile right and they're not like us and so there are distinctions between us and them and so even when they come in we hold them off and they're not in our in our category in our class or they're not qualified to come into our little groups right so we just ostracize them we isolate them because we don't want anything to do with them because they were not ready and it's a mistake i wonder how many of us this elder son's attitude is, is, is can be seen in, 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 in us. I wonder how many of us on the platform, how many of us watching and listening might be honest enough to self and to God to recognize that this attitude has no place and I need to get rid of it. I need to stop judging people based on what they have done or may have done, right? I need to stop condemning people. I need to stop be, being condescending, looking down at people as if I am better than them. And, you know, based on how I have lived, I deserve a reward and I deserve to be promoted. And based on what they have done, they need or deserve to be punish or 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 at least they must face the consequences i wonder how many of us are like that elder son there are some key lessons that are also evident in this passage our heavenly father firstly loves his children even when they turn away from him his heart yearns for them in love the lord would write through jeremiah the prophet you know to israel his beloved return to me yes you backsliders and i will heal your backsliding now that you know the lord would send a message a lesson right to israel through through i think it was the, the, the prophet uh, was it amos right who god told him to go and marry a harlot right and then when the harlot uh, 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 cheated on him and went back to her harlotry, right? The Lord would say, I want you to go find her and I want you to, to make it up with her and take her back unto yourself. That This is a real thing, you know. Amos had to marry the prostitute and the prostitute go, went back to prostitution and Amos would leave her. God said, go back and remarry her just to prove to Israel how much God wants to marry them even after they had prostituted themselves to to idol worship and to false gods god said i will marry the backslider yes that, that's how much our heavenly father loves us especially when his people return to him with a penitent attitude when, when they're sorry you know, when, we, when we're really sorry for things that we have done, you know, when we're really sorry for, for our constant failure and falling to weaknesses and so on, God is ready to embrace us, right? What the Bible says, in all three 
of these, these, these parables that Jesus would have given in response to the scribes and, and the Pharisees calling him a lover of sinners. All of these parables, Jesus ended them with what? Joy in heaven when one sinner repents or return to the Lord, or gives their life to the Lord. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God, which is the same thing, right? When, when this woman, right, finds that silver coin, the Lord says that in the same way, whenever a sinner come, is found and, and return to the Lord, there is joy in the presence of angels. And with the story, parable of the prodigal son, there is joyful celebration. Yes? Because my son, who was dead, is now alive. My son, who was lost, is now found. It was the right to make merry and be glad. Because of this very fact. My son is back home. Brothers and sisters, we have to treat with, with our, our backsliding brothers and sisters and, and those who are yet to, to know the Lord. We have to treat them carefully, handle them as, as, as fragile elements, yes, and, and not, just, not just be insultive, not just seek to embarrass them or think that we, we need to punish them, right, or we need, to, we need to hold them off and, you know, we're not talking to them, they're not welcomed in our space anymore, right, because they have backslidden or because they're living a life of sin. We have an obligation to reach out to them. And to recognize that when they come to the Lord, there is jubilation. The fatted calf is taken out. And the Lord is ready to embrace, to put his robe on you, to put his ring on your finger, to embrace you and to kiss you and to have a party. My God, celebration. We need to approach people with a similar attitude. Right? Too many of us, we just preach this doom and gloom and, and standing outside and in darkness and you're going to go out hell and you're going to burn up and whatnot. And we just condemn this, this, this condemnatory attitude that we take to people and we put it on them, right? We must remember, as Paul would have reminded his hearers in his letters so many times, we were not much different from they are. But sometimes we give the impression that, boy, oh, we were nowhere near. That self-righteousness. We have to be careful that we're not taking on the attitudes of the Pharisees and the scribes instead of taking on the attitude of Christ. Secondly, the faithful children of God. Yes? And, and that's what I was queuing into a while ago. Need to understand the proper way to receive the erring child who returns to God. Right? Not with sibling jealous, jealousy, yes, but with joy or celebration, with a strong reaffirmation of love. Brother, you have fallen, but I want to help you. Welcome back to the fold, man. God bless you. Yes, I want to hold your hand and, and I, want, I want to become a mentor. I, I want you to, to feel free to come to me. Any struggle that you're having, right? I want to help you as best as I can and to be genuine about it. By your words and, and by your actions, people must see that we genuinely want to help them. Reaffirm that love, yes? This love as it was illustrated by the father in the parable of the prodigal son. You, you just, you're just happy. You, you're just so happy that they, they've returned that you're not even concerned about why they went backslide in the first place. You're not concerned about what the fault was, whose fault was it, what happened. Let's just say it was the devil. I think it's okay to say that. Yes? The fact is the person is back. And we're just happy that they're back. I'm happy that you're in the faith. I'm happy that you've decided to give your life to the Lord. I'm happy that you've decided to recommit your life to the Lord. I'm happy that you, you still have a love and a passion for God. These are the things that must outweigh all the other negative things that would have come into the picture, into the fray at some point in time. We must allow the positives to override the negative at all times. Don't allow the negative. Sometimes it's just a few, you know, but because we give them so much attention that it crowds out, right, all the good things that are happening in the present. Be 
because we are so concerned about the past and what might happen in the future and boy we're not sure about this and we're not sure if they should be reinstated brothers and sisters remember the prodigal son his father embraced him many of us are being like the the the, the, the angry caught up in your feelings older brother who just feel that boy there should be any celebration because how come nobody now celebrate we and we not the church for much years and we're not getting any appreciation but as soon as one backslider come back everybody clapping yeah as soon as one sinner come in everybody clapping yeah and look how long we're in there and we have been so faithful that self-righteousness we have never deserted the church yeah but you backslide from god a few times talk it truth please god and shame the devil yeah, you may have been faithful to the church. But all of us, in our minds, by our actions, all of us would have departed, would have strayed. Some just a little bit further than others. But all of us would have been wayward. It's just that we're used to the routine. We know what people expect. We know what they're looking for. And we can put on a good show. That's the truth. That's why Paul would say, we are no different. In times past, we were no different. So we must learn to embrace people. When they repent, when they come to know the Lord as personal Savior, right? And we must not judge them based on what they have done. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 6 to 8, Paul speaks about uh, after, after, after uh, appropriate punishment would have been established, right? Upon those who would have, would have uh, uh, disregarded the body of Christ, right? And you would have exhausted all the avenues to, to restore them and, and they decided not to respond. Paul says when they respond, right? Whatever punishment was inflicted that the church thought was appropriate and the man do his time. Don't hold it against him, right? But you ought to, on the contrary, rather to forgive and to comfort him right yes you don't want this man to be 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 swallowed up right with so much sorrow right so paul urged the believers at corinth to love the brother yes he has done wrong but but he's sorry he accept that he's wrong and he accept the punishment why are you still holding this 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 noose over his head right this big stick is up there the hammer is in your hand you're just ready to hammer him down no paul says forgive the brother love the brother reaffirm that love because it is important as a brother to reaffirm that love there are some people out there some people in the church who who are struggling you know to 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 find that warmth and and that love and that that reassurance from the brethren right? because some of us we just cool shoulder towards people and we make them feel as if, boy, hey, we're not going to let you get past that which you have done in the past. Especially if there is something personal there. No, 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 no. You're not coming near me. You're not coming near me at all. I remember some years ago, I was at a church and, and um, there was a sister who, you know, got pregnant outside of marriage. And, you know, she had her, her baby and uh, she recommitted her life to the Lord, was rebaptized, and... And uh, 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 she came back in the church, right? And and she 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 made herself available over time, right? She she became active again. She was she was a a, a, a participant in 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 the worship service, and you know she she extended herself, right? And she was willing to subscribe to and do whatever was required of her. There was one brother who thought that um, it shouldn't be so because she got pregnant and she wasn't married so i said brother what are you saying that we should we should never allow her to come back in the church no that's not what he's saying but but we're allowing her to to participate and and to do things in church i said but but the child is about five years old now four going five it means that boy, this has been about four or five years right so so what are you saying she should wait a bit longer he said yes me say, how much longer he couldn't tell me but he just knows that boy it's too soon said then what is what is what is the right time what 10 years 15 years or we should just 
keep it open that way and say it's unlimited and she just stay there he couldn't answer me and i was shocked that boy he was like this but something came to me that there are a number of us in the church who feel that if people backslide and they come back then it's almost as if we must keep them in the wilderness of waiting and never allow them to become fully reinstated because of the nature of their sins but what about our sins what about our secret sins why, why are we bashing people why are we putting people down people who have repented and would have come back to the lord we just feel that boy well god forgive them but we not forgive them and we not forget what they do we need to forgive and we need to move on yes we have a we, we have we have a kingdom to populate that is a kingdom of god right and we have we, we we have to nurture people we have to we have to help people to understand and, and we have to help people to see the light of christ within us we have to let our good works be seen and it must be genuine right it can't be a fake thing so we need to allow the world to see the love that we have for one another we need to allow the world to see that even when one of the prodigal ones among us would have gone astray been wasteful extravagant but return repentant and penitent we must embrace them we must be ready to give them that holy kiss and to show them that hey we want you to be a part of what is happening here you are still a part of us you are my brother you are my sister we are going to make it together that's what the Lord wants for us and I have no doubt that this is why the Lord would have revealed this parable to his hearers. Not just for the Pharisees and the scribes, but for his own followers. And by extension, all of us today. Now these three parables were told by Jesus to teach these important lessons. Yes? The lessons of of, of, of our father's love and, and, and the response from heaven upon the return or the salvation of a soul and also importantly to help us to understand what our attitude should be like towards those who are repenting of their sins they're penitent they're sorry they're feeling sorrow for what they have done we don't need to beat them down any further you know you know why the man is down and the man is sorry boy instead of helping to lift the man up boy you know step on him a little more and said stay down there mm -mm. no nah, let him up at all tall tall huh no brothers and sisters we need to take on the attitude of jesus christ brothers and sisters i hope that these three parables would have connected the parable of the lost sheep the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the prodigal son the lessons are indelible lessons and we must not miss them but we must seek to apply them to our lives we must never forget brothers and sisters that was jesus who said those who are well in saint luke chapter 5 verse 31 and 32 have no need of a physician but those who are sick i have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance we have a job to do we must get the focus right and we must learn the right attitudes in order to reach out to those who are lost yes we have a responsibility to rescue the perishing to care for the dying not just to be caught up with ourselves and happy and enthused that we are on our way to glory we must seek to help those who are lost and seek to restore them to the kingdom God bless you. I want to thank you so very much for joining. I, I hope that you would have been blessed by this lesson this evening. Very popular par parable. But I want us to be able to put it into perspective and to apply the lessons to our everyday life. Because every day we get an opportunity to interact with sinners, to interact with backsliders, to interact with people who are interested in coming back into the fold or interested in becoming a member of the fold. God is welcoming them. I think that we should work on our own attitudes and welcome them as well. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the great 
doctrines and parables of the Bible, in particular those that you would have shared while you were on earth, O oh Lord. They have significant lessons for us to learn, lessons that we can apply to our lives and put them into practice and thereby lead better lives. Lord God, we do not want to become castaways. We do not want to miss the mark so badly. Lord, that heaven is not our final destination. Lord God, we want to be faithful, not just to church. Lord God, not just to traditions and rituals, but we want to be faithful to your word. We want to be able to clothe those who are naked. Lord God, to feed those who are hungry, to visit those who are sick and in prison. We want to be able, Lord, to offer assistance to those who are in peril, great danger. Those who are, who are dying and living in sin. Those who are lost and don't even recognize that they are lost. Lord, we want to reach out to them. We want to reach out, Lord, to the least of your servants and your children. God Almighty, and to help them to the best of our abilities. God, we thank you for this word. May it resonate within the hearts of your people. And may we be careful to put them into practice as best as we can. By your grace, we can do it, Lord. Remember the sick this evening. Remember the shuttings. Remember, Lord, those who are less fortunate than we are. Remember those who cannot even help themselves. We pray that you will become their strength and offer, Lord, help to them, even as you empower us to become your hands extended. May your blessings, God, emanate on this platform. And may everyone, God, receive from you, Lord, in a special way, as we prepare, Lord, as you grant us the wherewithal to do so, to face another day. Lord, whatever you have in store for us, then you bring it to pass. We will trust you always as we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just want to remind the platform that the funeral service and burial for uh, Sister the, uh, the matriarch of the chambers, that Cece and, and uh, who, Cece's grandmother and um, sister or uh, Auntie Annie's mother comes up on, on the, the 20th of, of this month, Tuesday the 20th of this month, and also the funeral and burial for the late Renford Patterson is slated to convene on the 12th of August. So let us remember both families, the Chambers and the Pattersons. I, I see Ray Patterson is on tonight. You know, please, Ray, accept our deepest and warmest condolences. We know you miss your, your, your father. And just know that we are praying for you and praying for your family. You have our support 100%. You can, you can count on that, that we have your back. The Lord bless you richly. Let's remember them, everyone. And also those who are still smarting from losses, recent losses. Remember the curtains. Remember Sister Curtain. You know, you know she she needs your prayers. We want to keep them in our prayers. And I, I have given the commitment that not just myself but the church to include this platform will remember them consistently in our prayers. So thank you very much for joining. Enjoy. The rest of this week going into the weekend looking forward to um, uh, interacting with the brethren those who can make it for face to face on sunday and for those who will continue to join us online on this platform and also on youtube uh, looking forward to that as well as as we meet again next week wednesday to share another parable and to learn lessons from it so again God's blessings be with you. And Karis is coming. She is eager to come and help with the countdown as usual. So we are out in five, five four, four, three, three two, two, one. Peace, peace. everybody. All right, brothers and sisters. Have a good night.